All right, everyone, part two of the flame of God and the flames that God gives, um, the flames that God sets forth. We are going to build off of last week. And so if you haven't watched last week, you certainly don't have to watch it before you see this one. However, I would encourage you, um, I, I mentioned uh, last week that I think this two-part, little two-part mini-series are some of the most important things that I can share um, as a pastor. And I think feel uniquely called to share and even just looking at life um, not only the things that I went through but um, in my own life but in the flames of life that, that God um, helped us and our family navigate through but also just from a theological point of view noticing how our culture and how our expressions of Christianity today talk about the flames of God there's not um, I, I think we're missing something I really do. I think we're missing an important process that even the, even those of us clothed in Christ still go through. And we're so trained to only see the flames from a negative perspective. Um, so I want to challenge that. I want to do something different. And, and I really feel called to preach this sermon. So I hope you tune in and meet me here at the end so we can uh, have a little devotional thoughts when we finish. See you then, everyone. All right, so like I said, we have a busy day today, but we are so grateful and privileged to be able to give that scholarship to you, Eric. We are excited, Parisa, about your baptism today, and right now it is time to worship Almighty God. So I would like to ask Eric, this Eric, okay, <laughs> if he would lead us in the call to worship, but I am going to ask that we all stand as we begin our Good morning, Red Oak Church. Good morning, Eric. Call of worship this morning is taken from Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know no. that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his court with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And, and his faithfulness to, to all, all generations. generations. Amen. Amen. So, we're going to sing... Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, spirit divine. Now, I say this kind of often, but I'm going to double down on it. And when we sing this, you realize we're also praying as we praise God. We're talking to him. You're not singing to us, right? And I'm singing to the person next to you. You're asking God to open your eyes so that we can see his will, not our own. So let's go to God in prayer and in praise. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, Spirit divine. Open Voices of truth. 
I know we got a, a good crowd in here, but you got to move a little bit to this. You got to be able to put your left foot to your right foot a little bit here. Ready? Here we go.
Amen. Amen. Listen, I want us to sing praise God from whom all blessings flow. And I want, before we do it, for you to take a minute and to think about what you're most grateful for. I want you to think about your blessings so that we're not just singing something and not really thinking about it. When we sing praise God for whom all blessings flow, I want to hear something come out from within us like we just thought about the area in our life that we feel the most blessed and we can't help but sing this out. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. seated everyone. Um, I'm just uh, want to just take a quick thing and, and just to, um, I know Carol talked about um, 100 hours sharing. Um, I just want to just uh, say that when you see a tragedy in a worldwide tragedy, whether it be hunger, whether it be floods or hurricanes or whatever, 100 hours sharing, just so you know denominationally, I think it's 98.5%, 98% goes exactly where it's supposed to go. And um, I just want to remind you that we have a deacon's fund here for the needs within our church. But there's also worldwide needs that need to be addressed, especially starvation and those who have experienced great tragedy. So one grid hour sharing is a way our denomination uh, com combines with, with some other denominations to give. And to, so I, I ask that you give because you love the Lord. And I ask because you to give because there are people who are suffering because of tragedies. So may God be with you as you give. And I also just want to say one other thing is that on behalf of the pastor and on, behalf of the, on our staff and the church itself, we want to thank you for your gifts, for your giving, for making uh, this church possible in terms of uh, uh, what you give. And I believe the Lord is doing something great here. Amen? Amen. And I can't wait to see the future. Also, I don't know if junior church, got, uh, junior worship got announced, so I'm going to announce it, that if there's any of our younger uh, worshipers here that did not know that the train was leaving, the train left, you can still catch it right down that hallway, though. Just run fast. Run fast. Ah. So I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to embarrass someone because he's my kid and it's fun. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to use this to talk about prayer, right? The Bible says, pray without ceasing. And if you think praying means you do all the talking, then how would you pray without ceasing? You wouldn't have time for even a conversation with anybody because you'd just be constantly talking to the Lord, right? So that's not really what pray without ceasing means. What it means is we are in an ever and ongoing dialogue with God. In every situation, if we're not calling on his name, we're listening for what he might give us. It's constant. And my wife and I, we've been saying, <coughs> you know, New Year's resolution, I think I, I've said, was, uh, you know, we want to make sure that at night we spend some time as a couple in prayer. And, you know, sometimes you do that, sometimes you don't, right? Well, my son, Caleb, got his license yesterday. And wouldn't you know, wouldn't you know we made real sure last night when he was at his friend's graduation party that we prayed last night, Okay. And so it's funny how when moments come that you want to make sure the Lord hears you, you never forget to pray, right? But again, Scripture says that dialogue should be ongoing. And so we're going to take this time right now, and I invite you to think about prayer not only as what we say, but what we hear. 
As the scripture says, the Spirit of God will search our hearts, even when we don't know what to pray for, and bring out from those places deep within that are too deep for words. Bring it before Almighty God. He knows already. You may say, why say it if he already knows? Which parent out there, even if you know your kid is struggling, doesn't want to hear their voice? Which parent out there, if you know your kid is excited, doesn't want to hear their joy? Prayer. I'm going to ask as we sang, <coughs> silently now, I wait for thee, ready my God, thy will to see. I'm going to ask us for a few brief moments for us to be in silence, for us to ask God specifically to make the soil of our heart ripe and ready for the word. And then I'm going to ask to close in prayer. And if in that time you want to lift up anything before Almighty God, just lift it up quietly to yourself. Let him know the deep places in your heart. And I'll ask Tony if you wouldn't mind coming and preparing and praying for the sermon when we're done. Just take a moment be still before God. There's too much hustle and bustle today. God, we always think we have to fill the empty space. Teach us to be still in a world today that is so busy all the time. Lord God, hear the cry of our heart. Holy Spirit, be a soothing and a calming presence within as we go deeper into trust and surrender more and more to you. Lord, you hear the joy of our heart for all the things that we're grateful for. We come to praise you for them. And thank you, Lord, for the life that we live in Jesus Christ. Grow us today. Holy and eternal God, we are so grateful and thankful. And we stand in awe at your wondrous works, O oh God, that you are doing in this place. Father God, we lift our hearts up this morning to say thank you. Thank you for the abundance of your grace and mercy that you have bestowed upon us. God, we are not here on our own strength, but by your eternal spirit, O oh God. You have strengthened us this morning, raised us from our beds of affliction, O oh God, that we come into the house 
of worship, O oh God. We thank you, Almighty God, that you looked over us on last night, protected us and our families and our loved ones. Father God, we thank you that we didn't receive a report this morning that one of our loved ones passed on last night. We thank you for the health and strength of our children, oh God. We thank you for the stability of our finances, for our homes and all that we have. Oh God, we have received that from you. Father, I pray today that every heart will be open and receptive to the word of God that is coming through Pastor Ryan this morning, that is being delivered from heaven by the Holy Ghost. Father God, we thank you. We believe, oh God, that when we leave this place today, we will not walk out in the same manner in which we walked in. We believe, oh God, today there will be a transformation in our hearts, oh God, a transformation in our lives, a transformation in our walk with you. God, I pray that you will make the crooked path straight in our lives, that we may look upon you, the author and finisher of our faith, oh God. If we bow our knees to you, Father God, like we stand in holy reverence of your eternal presence. Holy Spirit, we ask that you will have your way in this place today, shaping Moses into the children that God desire us to be. God, we was created for your glory, and we thank you, God, as we gather here as the children, as the sons and daughters of God. Father, we come to get a word from heaven. We believe, oh God, that you will speak to us today through our pastor, Pastor Ryan. Holy Spirit, we ask that you will use him in a way that you have never used him before. God, raise him to another level, oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Father God, speak to him, oh God, that he may share that which he have heard unto us, that we may be encouraged, oh God. Father, there's so many things that's going on in the world today that is tearing men's hearts down. But God, we come to be encouraged by this word tonight. We pray a special anointing over our pastor, God, that you will cover him. We plead the blood of Jesus Christ over his mind that he hear no other voice than that voice that rings from heaven in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. So God, I just pray that the soil of our hearts would be broken, the foul ground would be destroyed, oh God. I pray, God, that we would have tender hearts and receptive hearts, God, in the name of Jesus. Father God, we ask that the Holy Spirit will stir our hearts. Father God, send fire from heaven to purge us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let the water of heaven quench our thirst, O God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Your word declared that we have to draw water from our salvation. Jesus Christ is our salvation. We come to draw water from his word today. So Father, we ask that you will have your, have your way in this place. Father God, I just pray from Pastor Ryan from the crown of his head to his feet, God, that you would use every bit of him to bless your people today. And Father God, I pray that the anointing that you have placed upon him, it would increase even the more, God, in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father God, in advance, we give you thanks for what you're doing through our pastor, God. We ask that you will continue to bless him and Nick and their family, God, that they grow as one, God, that they, and we thank you that you have given this family unto us. Father, we honor them today. We ask your blessings, Lord God, your glory be with them. Your grace, O oh God, be their foundation. Your wisdom, O oh God, be their guide. Your understanding, O oh God, will be their comfort in the name of Jesus Christ. So God, we thank you today for what you're about to do. We came into this place with expectancy in our hearts, and we will receive from the Lord today. Bless you. Thank you. Good morning, Red Oak. Are we ready to hear what the Lord might give us from the scriptures? And I can only um humbly ask that he would use me and speak through me and strike away any word that would come into my mind even before it reaches my lips that's not in accordance with his will. I want to start with a scripture today because you, you probably know that I'm getting back on track having been out all right, and I, I got to preach a sermon on Tuesday, never got to preach it on Sunday because I was sick, all right, and now we're landing. So this has been like two weeks I've been waiting to, to, to do this part. Last week I did the other part of it where we broke it up in two about the flames and fires of God, right? So I'm asking us to be ready for what God might say through his word. I'm asking us to listen because as I mentioned last week, Last week's message and this week's message about the fires of life and now the fires of God are to me 
two of the most central and important things in my understanding of the word, in my understanding of the walk with God, in my understanding of how he grows us, in my understanding of what, as a pastor, I feel even called to preach upon and called to grow as a congregation in with you, not at you, but with you. I can think of no, no two topics that I feel in my life more called specifically to preach about than the one from last week, which I'll review in a minute, and the one this week. So I'm asking you to have ears that hear today. And I want to get right into the scripture. I'm going to ask you a question derived from these two verses. The first is from 2 Peter 3, 7. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Right now, people are going, uh-oh, we're hearing a fire and brimstone sermon. Yes, but it's going to be a little different than the fires you may have heard about before. So stay with me. What I want you to get from this is the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, this is saying that creation is being stored up for fire that comes at the day of judgment. How many think that sounds like a fun time? But watch Romans 8, 19. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. And the background on that verse is the revealing of the sons of God are when we're caught up in the cloud and come down to the new heavens and the new earth. It's right from Revelation and 1 Thessalonians and Revelation 20 and 21, right? And so... My question is, if creation, the creation that exists now is being stored up for the fire on the day of judgment, why is creation waiting and even longing for it to happen? Who longs for their own fiery demise? How can that be? How can it be that creation is being stored up for fire on the day of judgment and creation can't wait for it to happen? See, I think, I think in some ways we don't have a good handle on the fires of God, and I want to make sure that by the time we're done today, we do. And so I may say things from a different way that, that maybe sound a little new and different, but I am going to pull them out of the Scriptures. I am excited to preach a fire and brimstone sermon, and it's going to be different than what you think when you hear fire and brimstone. All right, let's review. Last week, I talked about the fires of life, and if you remember where it says that, that Moses, you know, came to Mount Horeb, and he brought Israel back with, from the, through the Red Sea from Egypt to Mount Horeb, and Mount Horeb was called the Mountain of God, and Mount Horeb eventually changed to Sinai. And Horeb, if, does anybody remember, this is where I test you and I find out how many people were sleeping in my sermon last week. What does Horeb, with a root word in, in Hebrew, that root that's in the word Horeb, what does it mean? Anyone remember? The wasteland. And we made the point that God is the God who meets you in the wasteland of your life. He meets you not where everything is always rosy, though he can. He meets you when those areas that you feel are wasted and can never be redeemed. And he takes Horeb and turns it into Sinai. And he takes Saul and turns him into Paul. And he takes Simon and turns him to Peter. He comes to us in the brokenness. He calls to us from the flames, but this time the flames don't burn us. And then he sends Moses, if you remember the way we ended, right back to Egypt, right back to the place that he got burned in life. But this time, a little different. Because the fire that burns in now is like the burning bush. It's ablaze, but we're no longer consumed. And so that's where we left off. If you remember, I talked about the transfer station, right? That God meets us in the waste pile. And all those junk parts of the life and God standing on top of that, that waste pile, top of that tra transfer station says, these areas of your life that you think are gone and broken and can't be redeemed, wait till you see what I do. I'm going to turn the fragrance into something pleasing for God. So today I have another important question and it's going to directly relate to the question I asked you about the scriptures that we started with. If God is going to sustain us through the fire, why does he let us go through the flames at all? What's the point? And this sermon is deeply personal for me. 
If the burning bush is going to be on fire but not consumed, understand, it says it's still called the burning bush. And sometimes the fires of life, they don't consume us, they don't sink us, but they still burn, don't they? Anybody in this congregation who's watching online, who's walked through the fires of life, know, yeah, I may have made it through, but man, it was a scorcher. Why does God let it happen at all? Why do we even have to go through the flames? Because life feels like that sometimes. It feels like we didn't get consumed, but we still got scars on us. We still got the burn marks in our heart from these flames of life that we had to walk through. And I think to understand what's going on in Scripture, understand the burning bush, to understand the flames of life, to understand when John the Baptist looks at Jesus and says, he is the one who's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. You have to understand the way the ancient world understood the term fire because it's different than we do. You hear the fires of God, you think about that first passage, right? It's stored up for fire until the day of judgment. You hear fire and brimstone. You hear the word fire and the flames of God. We get a little uncomfortable like, is it hot in here? I hope I'm going to be okay. And can you please send the cooling rains, Lord? But the ancient world would have understood fire differently because they were an agricultural society. They existed based on crops and what they could produce. And when you have that, they began to see in all of creation a fingerprint of God in the way creation worked. They could see his handprint, and they understood fire a little differently. And here's my point. How many of you have heard in farming, right, or in growing crops of the slash and burn technique? Okay, raise your hand if you've heard it. Okay, a lot of you. What's the slash and burn technique? Well, when the soil starts to lose all its nutrients, it's been sucked dry, and a lot of people talking about the world today feels like it's going in the wrong direction. A lot of people feeling like the good stuff of life is being diminished. Well, when the soil started to deplete, What they would do is they would light, they would take all the weeds and the the bugs and the critters that were in there that grew, right? Anybody who knows that, you know, has been done any, we had a garden, right? The, The bugs will eat it alive. So as it gets overgrown with weeds because the fruit doesn't have enough nutrients to grow in the soil, right? What they do is they bundle it all up and they light it on fire. They take all the, all the, the vegetation, all the, the, the weeds, and they bundle it up. And once it's dry, they set it on fire. And the layers of the resulting ash are rich with new nutrients to grow crops. It's like fertilizer. The land becomes fertilized from the ash of the fire so that something new can grow. Can you begin to see why creation might be waiting for that fire? Can you taste a little bit of where we're going in this? That sometimes it takes the fires and the flame and a bit of a slash and burn process so that the soil and the soil of our heart can become ripe and rich with nutrients so that a new seed can come in and bear new fruit. When I lived in Granby, I remember riding uh, our dirt bike back through these woods area, okay? And um, I I came to a part, and it was, I could tell it had all been burnt down. And I remember the person with me was saying, yeah, this is is a place that bears can be a lot because of all the berries that grow. I said, why are there so many berries just growing right here in the middle of, of, you know, of nowhere. I don't see berries in any of these woods. Why is it growing here? He said, this is the place that was, that was put on fire. It was a fire out here. And what do you think the first thing that grows out of, out of the ashes of a flame? Fruit. New berries. And they were just everywhere. They're the first thing that survive. New fruit. Boy, there should be a lot of metaphors starting to go into that agricultural society about new fruit and the fruits of the Spirit of God livening up in us, right? And then what they do, they last for about five years, and then that nutrient's used up, and then they go through the whole process again. And you know when they do it? They do it right before the rainy season. You know why? Because once that soil is rich with nutrients from the ashes, the rains come and that new seed thrives. 
And this, brothers and sisters, is why the Holy Spirit is referred to as both fire and rain. If you want to know why does the Bible sometimes talk about the Holy Spirit comes like rain and sometimes comes like fire, it's not because the Bible was a big James Taylor fan, okay? That's not why it's fire and rain, all right? It's because the Holy Spirit works in your heart. There is a slash and burn process that has to take place within us. Just like creation is longing for it, it's got to take place in us. Matter of fact, it says that we're the first fruits of what creation is longing for. Something in here that has all the junk, that has all the weeds, all those bugs and critters that devour all that lack of nutrients, something slashes and burns in here to make the soil of our heart ripe for the seed to come. And when the seed of Jesus Christ is planted within us, brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit will then come like rain to produce those berries. Something's got to die for something to live. Something's got to get set ablaze. See, fire in the ancient world had two purposes. One, yes, it was a sign of judgment. I don't diminish that. I can't, I'm not trying to get around that in Scripture. It was a sign of judgment to put an end to something, to take care of the weeds of life, to take care of those bugs that eat up, try to eat up all the good fruit, right? Yes, absolutely, but the other understanding of fire in the ancient world was the refiner's fire that purifies our heart, that takes away all those blemishes, that takes away all those imperfections so that the soil of our heart is ripe and ready for the rains to come. Sometimes you got to be willing to go to the fire, and what I'm concerned about is Christianity today seems like it's teaching a generation to run from the flames. Well, if you run from the flames, how is the soil of your heart ever going to be ready for the seed? See, for those of us who have Christ, who have that new, imperishable seed, the Scripture says, we, like creation, have to say, slash and burn. Take the junk away. And if all we do is teach people to run from that process, they aren't ever going to see the new rains, the new seed, and the new fruit. It's a mistake that I see being made, which is why I feel so called to talk to about it with us, so actually moved in my spirit to talk about it. If you've ever wondered why the Holy Spirit comes like fire, yes, Yes, there's a judgment, but don't forget the other understanding to purify. If I said to you, listen, if I said to you that the Lord Almighty God, was the, through the power of the Holy Spirit, was going to melt away all the imperfections and sins and blemishes in your life, you would say, hallelujah. And if I said the Holy Spirit's going to come like fire to melt away those things, that the fires of God are coming to melt away those things, we might go, ooh, I, don't, I didn't think I was supposed to go to that. I didn't think that was for me. Everybody goes through the fires. The question is, are you clothed? Do you have the, the, we got some firemen in here. Do we have the fire suit of being clothed in Christ? When the slash and burn happens, is there a new seed in us that's going to survive and not only survive, but when the rains hit, thrive? That's the question. If you have the new seed of Jesus Christ, you've got to be willing to say, Lord, it may take some fires, it may take some flames, but I melt those away from my life. I don't want them anymore. Why do you think Scripture says, I'm, I'm on like five or six weeks uh, in a row of quoting this, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. You know what that means? There was a slash and burn process in Paul's life, and the new seed is thriving in him. You are a new creation in Jesus Christ, Scripture says. So why are we telling everybody to fear and run from the flame? Creation can't wait for it to happen because they know, the agricultural society would have known it's from the flames that the soil is renewed. It's the flames that make the new creation. We're said to be the first fruits of it. The creation is looking and waiting for us as the first fruits so why are we not longing for that process to happen? If creation is longing, the word is longing, they can't wait for the fires to renew them. We should, be, we should raise up as a church right now and say, Holy Spirit, come like fire. 
take away, take away the weeds. I'm tired of myself. Pastor Down, you and I joke about this all the time, right? You just get tired of yourself. I want to look more like you. I need your flame to take away the old. I need your flame to melt away all those broken pieces of my life. I can't wait for the slash and burn process because there is a new seed alive in me. And when it's all done, that's the seed that thrives. You don't know Jesus Christ, you don't haven't received that seed, by all means, fear the flame. By all means. But if you have the new seed in you, sign me up for the slash and burn. I can't wait for that old stuff to get going. I told you, it's going to be fire and brimstone, but it's going to be a little different. It's from a different point of view. Maybe this is new. Maybe this isn't something that we've wrestled with before, but I think it's time we do because all we're doing today is teaching people a comfortable Christianity that avoids the flame, and it's sinking the church. Churches are going to be ready when things get hard. I actually, somebody asked me this question on, on Tuesday night when, when I preached it. They asked and they, and they said, you know, thinking about the stuff that happened in our family's life and childhood cancer is a tough thing, right, and all those things. And I say, you know what? I look back now, I believe God uses everything in our life to bring us where he wants us. I actually feel called to try and, and, and communicate this and get, uh, get myself as well as you to say, you know what? The flames may be hard, the fires may be hard, but they're gonna burn a little differently because this time the bush isn't being consumed. This time he's gonna raise up people like Moses to go back to the places that burned them, but this time be on fire for the Lord and this time it's not gonna sink us. This time it's not gonna sink us. Slash and burn. There's a new seed a new seed alive in us. Let it rain, Lord. Let it rain. We saw it, we sung it, was it last week? Let it rain. Open the floodgates of heaven, but understand, go back like you were an agricultural community. Yes, let it rain, but make sure, Holy Spirit, that you slash and burn some places in my heart so when it rains, this, the, from the ashes of the flame, the soil of my heart is ripe for the seed. So that answers our question. Look at 2 Peter 3, 7 again. By the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. And then go to, I'm going to give you a little more of this Romans passage, this second one now, just so you understand the context. Paul says, I consider the sufferings of this present time, the flames of this present time, the fires that I'm having to walk through at this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. You know what that's called? Slash and burn. But send the rains. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Creation can't wait for this time to come. For creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Hope that creation itself will be set free from bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We go first in this process. And if creation could long for it, let us long for it too. Amen? I can't wait. I can't wait to look a little more like Jesus tomorrow than I did yesterday, but not as much as the day after. And I love this last, verse 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth, renewal, until now. Why does creation long for its fiery demise? Because they know that's how things are renewed. We've been taught to see the fires of hell only through the fear of judgment, never realizing that when Paul says, there's a new seed in you, and the old self has to go so that all that's left is the new. You gotta hear the fires with different ears. We gotta long for nutrient-rich ashes to change the soil of our heart, a process we need to go through to be alive in him, 
ripe with nutrients. Why do we go through the flame? Skip over to 1 Peter 1.7 for me, please, Tiffany. Why do we go through the flame? To produce this new life in us. Look at what 1 Peter says. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by what? Fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter says it just like Paul. Everything we're going through right now, listen, I'm going to put it to you as blunt as I can. There has not been one single thing in my life that produced more new life for the kingdom of God in me than going through the hardest suffering I ever walked through in my life with my son. I don't know of anything that God used to mold me more than that one. And I wouldn't be here without it. I know the young people are in junior church, but I know we got some teens here. If you think for one minute that as you go through some hard times in life that God must not love you, God must not favor you. You just think back to Moses. You just think back to these, to these scriptures. God is going to bring you through the flames so that you burn a little different, so that you're set ablaze by the fires of the Holy Spirit, so that a slash and burn process might even happen in you, so that when you come out stronger, he'll send you back to the flames of old, and this time you're leading the captives out of Egypt. Because there's all types of bondage in this world. See, we have to see things a little differently. We got to see suffering a little differently. We got to see fire a little differently. We got to see why the fire and the rain are both the movements of the Holy Spirit in the soil of your heart. Jack, Caleb, Eli, Eric. Sometimes that process is uncomfortable. If you don't have Christ, if you don't have that new seed, if that new, those new berries aren't going to come up, then by all means, fear the flame. But if he is in you, you got to be like Moses. That bush is on fire, but it isn't being consumed. If God's here, I'm here. If God's here, I'm here. Because he's going to do something in this flame that will make the soil just right. Just right. We got to start teaching about the fire of God. Stop avoiding it. Because it is hope for those who know him. I know we haven't been taught that. I know we haven't. Test the genuineness of our faith. faith. More precious than gold. Test it by the fire. Before I close, I want to go back to Moses again. And I want to round up this little two-part series. And I want you to understand how this two-part series became important to me. Boy, it's so personal. Realizing that God sometimes sends us back to, to face and confront those hard flames in our life that burned us and realize this time we're not burning. And then today, to realize that those places that did burn us, God used so that the new seed can thrive. And even to the very end, I'm not afraid of the flame. I'm not afraid of the fire. Like creation before us, we've got to even long for it. Because there is a process that's going to happen that is our destiny and hope. Now, maybe you haven't heard fire and brimstone that way, but you're hearing it today. And when we're willing to step out and not fear the flame, all of a sudden we think back to Moses. Turn that passage up. And the Lord said, just after the burning bush, still right there in that moment, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. That's a lot of ites. It's a lot of ites. Why does God come to the wasteland? To deliver us from the ites. To deliver us from bondage in all forms. And now behold, listen, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. 
Come, I will send you to Pharaoh. Moses, I'm sending you back to the flame because there's a new flame that burns in you that you might bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Who am I is the question we have to ask. Who are we? We are the people that can go back to the flame but not be burned. We are the people who don't fear the flames because we know there's a new seed thriving in it. We are a people who can confront the flames and know that sometimes the slash and burn process is uncomfortable, but it's our hope that all that's left is the new berries and the new fruit, the new life that exists in us. Who are we? We are a people who are being sent out to set the captives free. But first you gotta face the flame. <coughs> can you feel that? Because he says, I will be with you. And this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you bring the people out of Egypt, you will serve on this mountain. You will serve and worship on me on this mountain. Deliverance happens when the wasteland turns to worship. When the fires that devour become fires of renewal. When the bush is on fire and it doesn't burn. When the slash and burn process is something you long for. Brothers and sisters, if you are holding on to the horrible of your life and it hasn't turned into Sinai, if you're spending your life right now trying to avoid all the hard stuff, never confessing, never confronting those areas of your life, I want you to hear the flames from a different perspective. I want you to remember that when God says, it's going to be a sign for you, I'm going to bring you back to this fiery wasteland. And this is where you worship. This is where you see the tail end of my glory. Maybe Horeb, like all of creation now, was longing to become Sinai. And maybe it's about that time that the church does too. Maybe it's about time we start preaching the flames that are our hope. Maybe it's time we start preaching that the Horeb in your life is going to be a blessed place to worship God someday. Amen. Let us pray. <laughs> Loving God, uh, rebirth is, is a difficult thing. I pray for our new candidate who will be baptized today. I pray that she will know that it's not an end, that it's not just about joy without suffering, or that being reborn and growing in the Lord is painful, it is getting rid of the old so that the new will come. I thank you, Lord, for this message that was delivered. I pray it will touch people's hearts today and that they will be given a brand new perspective about the flames and the fire that doesn't consume. Holy Spirit, lead us to places where we can grow so that we may be more like you each and every day. Amen. Oh, the fires of Horeb that turn into the rains of Sinai. The place where Moses said, show me your glory. And there God was on top the wasteland. Let's stand. <laughs> Caught a glimpse of your splendor in the corner of my eye. Most beautiful thing I've ever seen 
It was like a flash of lightning Reflected off the sky And I know I'll never be the same Show me your glory Send down your presence, Lord I want to see your face Show me It was like a flash of lightning Reflected off the sky And I know I'll never be the same Show me your glory Send down your presence I want to see your face Show me
I'm going to ask you all to please stay and support Parisa as she gets baptized right now. There's a testimony that she's about to make. And that testimony is that there was a slash and burn process in the soil of her heart. But there is a new seed that grows. So Lord God, send the rains. As, uh, as we get ready for the baptism, I would once again try to encourage all of you uh, to remember that um, don't leave this world without Jesus Christ. This young lady who comes before you, who will be baptized, she realizes the importance of what baptism means. Old self die and a new self be reborn. Baptism doesn't save anybody. It's a profession of what we believe. Baptism is the beginning of a Christian life. It is the beginning of walking with God. It doesn't mean that everything's perfect. It means that throughout your life, you will grow, and more and more you will grow into the likeness of your Savior Jesus. But it's not without a lot of work. It's not without some suffering. And so this is an honor for all of us to witness this wonderful baptism of this um, beautiful young lady. Um, I also would like to encourage you all, um, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, you might be a visitor here today. And I would say to you, please, don't leave this world without Jesus. Amen? Yeah. I mean, all of you are a testimony to that fact, but if there's someone here who feels God tugging at their heart, it's that time. Now is the acceptable time of the Lord to receive Christ, to bring him into your heart. So may this time be one of redemption, not only for a young lady, but for all those who are young at heart or are just who are now a new person in Christ. May God bless us all. Amen? Amen. As Parisa gets ready, I'm, I'm going to warn her now that the, um, the flames that have heated this pool have cooled. <laughs> but we thank you for the, uh, for the water, the living water. <laughs> oh. As I heard Pastor Dunn <clears throat> saying, I just want to echo, this process is really a testimony an outward sign and a symbol of what the Lord Jesus Christ has already done in Teresa's life. That the spirit of our Lord has already immersed her in the living water. That the process we just talked about today is already something she's experiencing even as we wait, like Paul says, I'm not made perfect yet, but I press on for that upward call in Christ Jesus that the new seed, when we see him as he truly is, the Lord says, unveiled, we know we will be like him. This is a profession of faith, a testimony of the process that has already begun and the assurance that the Holy Spirit will see it to completion. It's not the water I baptize her in that is salvation. It's the living water of the Spirit that Jesus Christ baptizes us in. That is paradise and all the good stuff after it. Parisa? Wait, it's a little deeper right here. It got a little colder, didn't it? Yes. Um, <clears throat> so Parisa approached me just a few weeks ago, and she said, I'm ready. I want to be baptized. See, the Holy Spirit, already working in her heart, she knows her Lord and Savior. 
Teresa, do you have anything you would like to share with this congregation before we do this baptism? Um, not the best public speaker, but just that I'm you know, grateful to the Lord and look forward to everything that's to come. Amen. Amen. So, Teresa, I'm going to have you step right up in here. I have a, this question is of paramount importance. Have you repented of your sins and received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And by the authority given to me, as a minister of this congregation, as a minister in the Church of Jesus Christ, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. Go in peace, everybody. God bless you. All right. The flame of God. Hopefully we challenged the way you may have viewed the flame of the Lord and certainly the flame of the Holy Spirit, but also just that process, right? We looked at, at how all creation um, is being stored up for the fire of judgment. Right? That, that hellfire, if you will. And yet creation's longing for it because it knows it's going to be renewed and purified. And so to me, that, that concept has really challenged me in life. It challenged my views that I had um, at one time. Why would, why would anyone, why would creation long? I mean, the Bible says that creation longs for it. So then it says we're the first fruits of this process. And so I think sometimes we miss that the flame of God is still going to judge those, uh, those imperfections and those unrighteous parts of our own life. But for those of us where the seed of Christ has been planted within, we're clothed in him, and there's a new life forming, we long for that process. That process is like our greatest hope. You don't have the seed of crisis, right? Like we talked about, there's, there's nothing new to survive that flame. There's no new life. There's no, nothing coming from the slash and burn process, right? But for those of us who have the seed of Christ, who already have experienced that seed growing in us, this, this is what remains. And this is our destiny. And so, again, a very maybe a different perspective than what you've heard about with the fires of judgment in the past. It, it, it's not that the old self in us doesn't die. It's not that the old self is not judged. It's that the old self um, is not also stored up for those flames of judgment. It's just that there's a new self growing in us and Christ has preserved us in that seed. And so I think that's a really important difference and one that, like creation, should make us long for it. And so I, I want you to spend some time, and I'm, I want to spend some time just thinking about, you know, if I was to say to you, um, right, hey, there's a chance for all your imperfections and all your faults and all your sins and all, your, all those, those things that you think are wrong to, to just melt away from you. And what was left was just pure beauty, just totally of God. Every one of us would probably say, yes, sign me up. And if I said, yeah, what melts those away is the, is the, uh, the flames of judgment. Then, whoa, whoa, that's not, I'm not supposed to have that, right? And so let's take this and let's, let's run with it. Let's think about those areas in life that you long. I, I want to connect with creation's longing today. And what are those areas in your life that you long for that slash and burn process to take them away. And how, how when, when that time comes and we, we see the Lord face to face and all that stuff is gone, what, a, what an amazing experience that, what will that even look like? I, I don't know. I, I guess so in some ways I'm saying the second part of this devotion is to let your imagination dream a little bit. It's going to look like when all the insecurities and all the brokenness is just gone and all that's left is that seed of Christ 
that's now alive in you. And so, again, two-step process here. Think about the areas that you long to have removed from your life and be honest with yourself, right? Confession's good for the soul. You don't have to confess to, to me, you confess to God. And then let your imagination dream in the Lord about the day that the refiner's fire has finished what's already begun in you. God bless you, everyone. See you next week.